Hi guys. It is a beautiful winter day. Imagine that uh, here in the collapse of global industrial civilization deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, we have made it to Wednesday, December 17th, 20... Uh, <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. It is Tuesday, December 17th, 2019, but we're going to pretend like it is Wednesday, December 17th, because this is going to be the Wednesday Chronicle of the Collapse here on Collapse Chronicles, and this is where you have stumbled into, and I am, my name is Sam Mitchell. <coughs> this is my little co-pilot, <coughs> Sancho Panza, joining me to do what we do every day, and that's to, uh, chronicle the collapse of a planet. So I am getting ready to have the great honor of <clears throat> interviewing this fellow, this ecologist uh, <clears throat> named William Reese. He is a professor up there in British Columbia uh, and he is going to be the wrap-up uh, the final interview for Collapse Chronicles here for 2019, and I am very thrilled to interview this man. So I am getting ready for the interview. So what I've been doing is spending a lot of time on this essay that William Reese has written that will be coming out in March of 2020 but he has been kind enough to send me an abstract of it. This will be coming out on the, from Science Direct, their Ecological Economics Journal in March of 2020. So I don't have a link to send you, but I will send it to you in March. And the name of this uh, essay, I did part one yesterday, you can find, I'll put a link to part one. The title of this is Ecological Economics for Humanity's Plague Phase. Humanity's Plague Phase. And so yesterday I read the, the first part of it. And so today we are going, what I'm going to do for part two is, and, and guys, I am skipping a whole lot of the, a whole lot of the, this is one of the best essays detailing the collapse of a planet I have ever read. So we're going to find out a little bit more about this plague species and then we're going to get to uh, <clears throat> William Reese's conclusions <clears throat> going into 2020. But first, Let's hear about Homo sapiens as plague species. Serious problems emerged in the fossil fuel age. Yes, they did. Coal, oil, and natural gas have helped raise the human enterprise so, so far from equilibrium that rising demand for Negentropy, uh, that's a whole nother term that uh, you don't have to worry about now. That rising demand pretty much for everything to maintain and grow the economy <clears throat> now exceeds the productive and, and assimilative capacities of host ecosystems. The resultant Eek and the resultant entropic disordering of the ecosphere is evident in biodiversity loss, dissipation of soils and material resources, including fossil fuels, accumulating greenhouse gas gases and climate change, ocean dead zones, etc. He could go on with this list. All signature symptoms of overshoot and apparent gross human ecological dysfunction. I say apparent 
because the root cause is natural. <clears throat> recall that all species, this is earlier in the essay, recall that all species populations have a predisposition to expand exponentially when exposed to a temporary abundance of some limiting resource, can you say in our case fossil fuels, many respond with an explosive population outbreak. Some species in simple ecosystems exhibit regular cycles of outbreak followed by collapse in which the outbreak is referred to as the, quote, plague phase of the cycle. The plague, in, th in this point humans, uh, the plague continues until negative feedbacks, food shortages, disease, predation, etc., depending on the species and circumstances, knocks the population back. <clears throat> Humans are as prone to population outbreaks as any similar species. Only the time scales differ. When fossil fuel technology <coughs> reduced the normal negative feedback by providing access to all necessary food and other material resources, humanity embarked <clears throat> on a 200 plus year global population outbreak now well into plague phase. That is exactly where we are going into 2020. We are well into the plague phase of our species. With all the negative consequences for the ecosphere described above, and again, guys, I have skipped over. This, this uh, is pretty much a book-length essay, and I will uh, be sending you the link in March. <clears throat> All right. This raises an important question for all economists. Can or should the human plague phase be extended indefinitely? Or will it wind down either through controlled implosion, gradual unraveling, or catastrophic collapse? <clears throat> the answer is suggested by examination of energy consumption by country and region as of 2018. So then he puts this, this graph out here where the horizontal line represents global average energy consumption per capita, remembering that energy use is tightly correlated with GDP. Relatively rich OECD, I think that's the organization of like developed economies, <clears throat> relatively rich OECD countries representing only 17% of the world's population consume 2.4 times as much energy per capita as would average citizens and 3.4 times as much as non OECD citizens, which make up 83% of the world's population. To address equity concerns and bring the present non-OECD population to just the average, the average 2018 OECD levels still low compared to high-end users such as Norway, Canada, and of course the United States, 
would require increasing global energy consumption by 140 percent at a global energy use growth rate of 2 percent per year, total primary energy use would double in just 35 years scarcely over two-thirds of the way to 140 percent and more energy and other resources would be consumed and dissipated during that doubling, meaning over the next 35 years, than the total to date since 1800. This is a major part, if you saw my interview with Tim Garrett, with Professor Tim Garrett, he talked at length about this. Uh, that, you know, between over the next 30, 35 years, the human enterprise is going to double, take everything that humans have done to this planet going back to at least 1800 and do th and double that in the next 30 to 35 years and then double that again. As Tim Garrett said, obviously something is getting ready to give. This is, this is 2 plus 2 equals 4. Okay, and so this begs some questions in, uh, in William Reese's mind. Are there adequate fossil energy supplies? What would this mean for CO2 emissions? Could the already stressed ecosphere cope? with the attendant massive entropy injection? And what about the expected additional billions of people? Yes, what about those expected additional billions of people? Meanwhile, the IPCC one and a half degree C Special report demands nearly 50% lower emissions by 2030 and complete decarbonization by 2050, i.e. a 6% annual reduction beginning immediately. Oh yeah, it's really going to happen. <clears throat> this conundrum will not this conundrum will not soon be resolved by the much heralded shift to green alternative energy. The hype over wind, solar, and other green energy sources notwithstanding, no fully adequate substitute for fossil fuels are available and absolute decarbonization is not occurring. Global energy demand, in fact, grew by 2.9% in 2018, led by natural gas. Carbon emissions grew by 2%. Renewables did contribute about a third of the growth in electrical power generation. Uh, solar now produces about 585 terawatts and wind about 1,270 terawatts globally for a total of about 1,850 terawatts. However, the global increase in demand for electricity in 2018 was 938 terawatts, 60 percent more than the total output of all existing solar installations. Just two years of electricity demand increase absorbs 
the entire contribution from more than three decades of wind and solar power development. And again, uh, Tim Garrett talked about this very thing, that the, the, the contribution from these green alternative energies can't even keep up with the extra demand in the total energy, which of course is being filled by fossil fuels. Even if the world were successfully to engineer an economically viable combination of fossil fuels and renewables sufficient to double our energy production, we still have a problem. The use of so much energy to expand and raise the human enterprise even further from equilibrium would guarantee both disastrous climate change and accelerate the parasitic hollowing out of the ecosphere. Bottom line, bottom line, the human enterprise will almost certainly be forced to contract by energy, food, etc. shortages or foundering life support systems. That is the bottom line. It's again, it's what Tim Garrett was saying. Something has got to give, guys. This cannot continue much longer. And then, let's see, then I'm going to skip uh, way down. There is so much here, guys. As I say, I could devote an entire channel to this, but we are going to move into William Reese's conclusions. Conclusions. Now what? A future role for ecological economics. <clears throat> okay. De facto human eco behavior should become the foundation for eco economic policy in the 21st century. It is clear for the reasons explored above and over, and I've barely even scratched them, that the human enterprise already exceeds global carrying capacity and is dangerously into overshoot. 68% in 2016, according to the Global Footprint Network. Ecological economists should look the biophysical data in the eye and respond accordingly. They must ask and seek to answer difficult questions that may not even occur to the mainstream. For example, question number one, what weaknesses inherent in existing environmental economics actually facilitate ecosystem degradation and overshoot? Question number two, can the damaged exosphere sustainably yet support another 2 billion humans plus a doubling of gross world product and various forms of energy and material demand as is expected by mid-century? <clears throat> we all know the answer to that question. <clears throat> Question number three. What economic tools and policies help, policies might help maintain a satisfactory quality of life while implementing, <coughs> <coughs> while implementing a planned contraction of planet depleting economic activities and populations. 
Yes, good luck on that one. Uh, question number four for the 21st century. What circumstances promote people's capacity for cooperation, community building, and short-term sacrifice to achieve mutually beneficial future ends, e.g. survival? Yep. In question number five, how can <clears throat> ecological economics help identify efficient policies to regenerate key ecosystems and maintain essential life support functions, including a predictably stable, livable climate? Of course, the overarching question is whether society will be willing and or able to organize globally to abandon the myth of perpetual growth with decoupling and articulate a compelling new social construct, construct for survival that will override rather than reinforce people's innate myopia and expansionist tendencies. Is there some combination of fear and hope <coughs> sufficient to dissolve our culture-wide conspiracy of denial or must we rely on some staggering ecological disaster to wake a world of sleepwalkers? Below are some elements, some elements of the paradigm shift needed to rescue human civilization from itself in the 21st century. <coughs> consistent with the biophysical evidence and <clears throat> ecological economic theory, <coughs> ecological economists should research ways to assist the global community to acknowledge the following facts. All right, what do we need to acknowledge as the global community? These are just a few of the things. <clears throat> Number one. First, the fallacy of human exceptionalism. Homo sapiens is a biological species like all others subject to the same natural laws and limitations, particularly the law of thermodynamics. Next, <clears throat> The human enterprise is an embedded subsystem of the ecosphere and that decoupling from nature is not even theoretically possible. Next, in the absence of rational controls, humans will use any sort of abundant cheap energy to over-exploit ecosystems and other resources. Once again, it makes no difference what the energy source is. Humans will use whatever energy source is available to them to destroy the ecosphere. This is what uh, probably I would have put that one at the top of the list. Okay. The human enterprise is an aggregate dissipative structure whose maintenance and growth necessarily drives the entropic disordering of the ecosphere. Next, there are fuzzy biophysical limits to ecosystems exploitation that may not be evident and whose location otherwise known as tipping points, may shift dangerously with changes in both natural conditions and exploitation rates. Next, human society 
has exceeded the regenerative limits of ecosystems and has become parasitic on the ecosphere. An economy that grows and maintains itself by depleting the biophysical basis of its own existence is inherently unsustainable. Next, human population dynamics are consistent with those of other K strategists and suggest we are in the outbreak plague phase of our population cycle. Next, technology has limits. Society maintains itself far from equilibrium on depletable fossil fuels and as yet there are no adequate substitutes. We therefore face a climate and energy conundrum on one hand, if we attempt to maintain the status quo on remaining fossil fuels, the world will suffer the dangerous consequences of a 3 degree C mean global warming, including disorderly economic contraction, while on the other hand, if we massively invest in current alternatives, it will not be possible to reduce CO2 emissions sufficiently to avoid climate change. There will certainly be energy shortages, inadequate investment elsewhere, and again, disorderly economic contraction. Next, in the absence of a controlled descent, chaotic collapse is probable <clears throat> and the usual outcome for societies whose leaders ignore evidential warning signs are too corrupt or incompetent to act accordingly. Thank you. Next, unsustainability is a collective problem requiring collective solutions and unprecedented international cooperation. <clears throat> Next, Earth is already overpopulated even at average material standards. A one Earth lifestyle for 7.3 billion people requires that humans learn to thrive on the biocapacity represented by 1.7 global average productive acres per capita. And gross income and wealth inequality is a major barrier to sustainability one Earth living requires mechanisms for fair income, redistribution, and otherwise sharing the benefits of economic activity. All right, that are a few of the things we need to learn. Okay, so consistent with these biophysical and social realities, the global community should, this is what we should do in the balance of the 21st century, <clears throat> accept that rational short-term economic behavior at the individual or small group level has become maladaptive at the long-term global level, meaning that your individual consumer and lifestyle choices at this point are a joke. Okay, we should formally acknowledge the absurdity of perpetual material growth and accumulation, the hallmarks of capitalism on a finite planet. We should 
choreograph, i.e. socially construct an extended eco-economic story compatible with the steady state operating principles of the ecosphere. We should shift the primary emphases of economic planning from quantitative growth and efficiency toward qualitative development and equity. <clears throat> we should begin the public cultural, social, and economic discussions and formal planning necessary to reduce fossil energy and material consumption consistent with estimates of overshoot of around 70% and IPCC mandated emissions reductions of 100% percent decarbonization by the year 2050. We should develop economically efficient and effective instruments to ration fossil fuels and allocate the remaining carbon but the, the remaining global carbon budget to essential uses such as food production and inner city transportation until adequate green energy supplies are available. Uh -huh. We should commit to devising and implementing policies consistent with a one earth civilization. The overall goal should be an ecologically stable economically secure, steady-state society whose citizens live more or less equitably within the biophysical means of nature. And we should conceive and implement a global fertility strategy to reduce the human population to the two billion more or less people that might be able to live in material comfort on this already much damaged single planet Earth. Good luck with that last and it should have been at the top not at the bottom of the list we should conceive and implement a global fertility strategy to reduce the human population. And winding up with his final conclusions after stating what we should do, no doubt the political and economic mainstream and many ordinary citizens, yeah, 99.9 percent .9 is many, <clears throat> and many ordinary citizens will see these principles and actions as impossibly radical. Again, however, they are consistent with basic theory and empirical evidence. On its current trajectory, the present system will crash. The present system will crash. The corrective throughput reductions suggested above are in line with those of various other technical analyses. Governments and corporate interests who reject this framework therefore have a moral obligation to explain why adherence to growth through technology does not risk fatal catastrophe. Time is short. Then he quotes uh, William Steffen, who I need to bring on the show, quoting Steffen, effective planetary stewardship must be achieved quickly as the momentum of the Anthropocene threatens to tip the complex Earth system out of the cyclic 
glacial interglacial pattern during which Homo sapiens has evolved and developed. Close quote. Back to <coughs> William Reese. It remains only to ask, what is the possibility that in the present post-truth era, the leaders of this increasingly fractious world community will be able to come to this or any other shared diagnosis and prescription for what ails the world. Humans are certainly prone to short-sighted self-delusion, but are also capable of high intelligence, reason, introspection, compassion, and even collective action toward a common goal. Herein, at least, lies the possibility, though little latitude for error. These almost uniquely human qualities will have to triumph over primitive instinct, <coughs> heated emotion, and once successful but now maladaptive cultural norms in shaping our collective response to anthropogenic global change. Belligerent intransigence may well destroy prospects for civilization and even deny Homo sapiens the possibility for further ascent of the evolutionary ladder. Tragic irony indeed if the Anthropocene is cut short by humanity's self Annihilation. <laughs> and uh, guys, as I say, between yesterday's video and today's, I covered maybe one half of one of the single most spot on essays I have ever encountered in 10 years of researching the single most important story in the history of humanity since we climbed down from the trees, and that is the collapse of, of global society and, more importantly, the planet. And I have got to wrap up today's chronicle of the collapse because I want to, I need to be talking to uh, William Reese, and I'm going to try to keep my own mouth shut and just let this man uh, size up the state of the planet for my final uh, Collapse Chronicles conversation of the year and the decade, which you can hear on Sunday, December 29th. And if you enjoyed anything that you just heard in uh, this video, by all means, would you please take a few seconds to thumb it up. If you did not like what you heard from William Reese about uh, where we're headed as a planet, by all means, spend a few seconds to thumb it down and please uh, take a few seconds to <coughs> subscribe to Collapse Chronicles uh, if you would like more of this information uh, for whatever reason. And with that, get out there and enjoy it while you still can. Bye, guys.